Hey everybody, this is uh, Christian from New Orleans again. Uh, we're gonna talk about um, the module four review. All right, vital signs, scene size up, patient assessment and pharmacology. Okay, so let's get right into it. Um, okay, vital signs and monitoring devices. Okay, so uh, your respirations. All right, so how are we checking those? How are we counting them? All right, first, uh, you wanna look, listen, and feel, all right? Um, check out the rate, the quality, and the rhythm, and regularity, all right? All those things, make sure the depth is good, all right? We wanna check out all those things, all right? And make sure that uh, the patient is breathing adequately. If they're not, if they're breathing inadequately, remember, we're gonna have to fix that, all right? There's all the different, um, all the different rates, for each one of the um, age groups there, okay? Adult, 12 to 20, adolescent, 12 to 20, uh, school age, 18 to 25, preschooler, 20 to 28 times a minute, toddler, 22 to 37, infant, 30 to 53, and then neonate is 40 to 60 times a minute. Now, um, you know, we're not gonna try to trip you up on the exam. They're not gonna be like, hey, how many times should a preschooler breathe, right? 20 to 27 times a minute? You know, they're not gonna trip you up, okay? Just know those. They're most likely gonna give you scenarios, you know, and they're gonna ask you if the patient is breathing adequately or inadequately, or do you need to oxygenate versus ventilate? Things like that, okay? Uh, next, we always wanna make sure our patients have a pulse, right? Okay, so for your adult patient, um, if they're awake, right? Uh, you want to assess their radial pulse, right? Um, if they're unresponsive and they look like they're not doing so good, right? Um, palpate that carotid, okay? Make sure um, you're um, checking there in the neck. Uh, for your pediatric patients, check the brachial, okay? At the brachial artery. And that's right there in between um, the uh, elbow and the armpit on the inside of the arm. Um, if you guys have kids at home, it's really, really easy to feel on the little ones, okay? So uh, kids a year or younger, right, um, should definitely be checking that radial pulse. Again, there's all your different um, pulse rates, okay? So know those. I'm not going to continue to sit here and waste time and read all those, okay? But you're going to have to know those for the exam, and you're going to know those for the rest of your life for your patient assessments, right? So you guys should know. You know, if I have an adult male who's, you know, 30 years old and he's saying he's weak and he feels like he's about to pass out and you palpate, you know, his, his, his pulse and it's 40, you know that he's bradycardic and something's wrong here. Okay. So know those. The skin. All right. So differences um, in skin presentation can tell you a lot. Okay. So some ones to look at here. Some, so remember, uh, pale, if they're pale, right? Um, they might be hypoxic, right? And then when they get um, severe hypoxia, they might become cyanotic or that blue, right? Those are all signs of shock, right? Poor perfusion. Um, modeling is that gray blue, that blotchy pattern on their skin. Um, jaundice, okay? Uh, jaundice uh, is that yellowing of the skin. You might see it in the eyes as well. Okay, that's indicative of like a liver problem. Okay, you might see that on your patients who, um, who are uh, chronic alcoholics. Okay, um, and then the skin. Whenever you're assessing the skin, guys, you see there it says color, temperature, condition. Those are the things you should be looking at. Are they pink, warm, and dry? Or are they pale, cool, and clammy? Okay, assess that skin temperature, color, condition. Okay, that's gonna tell you a lot. Right here where it says wet or moist, right? So, um, you know, if, if somebody just ran a marathon uh, and they're sweating, that sh that's normal, right? But if you walk in and, you know, the temperature is nice inside, they have an air conditioning going on and, you know, they're pale, cool, clammy and they're sweating, uh, you know, you notice that that's not right, okay? Something could be wrong here. So assess that skin. Uh, next, you see the eyes, all right? The eyes, they're, they're, they never lie, right? They're the window to the soul. Um, they can tell you a lot, okay? So when assessing those pupils, what you wanna do is briefly shine a pen light into the patient's eyes, okay? Uh, they should react, okay? When you put that pen light in there, they should constrict a little bit, right? So if a patient has 
constricted or pinpoint pupils, we call it, okay, pinpoint pupils. Um, that's indicative of like a central nervous system disorder or narcotics, okay, specifically opiates, okay? So uh, if they have those opiates on board and, you know, they have those pinpoint pupils, they probably took something, maybe some heroin or something like that, or some codeine. Maybe they're going codeine crazy, right? Maybe they're on that syrup, right? Maybe they're drinking that dirty Sprite. We don't know. All right, um, dilated pupils. That's when um, <clears throat> a patient uh, could be in cardiac arrest or there are amphetamines, right? Those are the uppers, right? The downers would be the, the, other, the other eye, right? Uh, if they're dilated, you know, they might be on the upper. They might be on some amphetamine or some stimulants like cocaine or crack, right? Or crystal meth, all right? And if they're unequal, okay, that's uh, due to uh, maybe a stroke or a trauma injury, okay? So uh, one might be really big and blown and not reactive and the other one reacts, okay? So just check the eyes. They don't lie, all right? They can tell you a lot. All right, and blood pressure, okay? We should be taking blood pressures on all of our patients, all right? Um, manual blood pressure readings are the most reliable, okay? They're better than uh, electronic and machines and stuff like that. Um, the monitors, you guys should be getting manual blood pressures on all your patients, okay? And you all should be practicing, practicing class, practice at home. That's the only way you're gonna get good at taking the blood pressure is by listening and practicing over and over again. Okay, um, when should you palpate, right? There's two different ways we could do a blood pressure. You can oscillate, like the guy's doing here where he's listening, right? Or you can palpate, okay? When you palpate a blood pressure, think about it. When should we do that? Well, a noisy environment, okay? Down here in New Orleans, we work a lot of um, standbys and details and stuff like that. We work the Saints games, okay? We work Voodoo Fest and concerts and stuff like that. It gets really, really loud. Okay, I'm not gonna be able to hear blood pressure when the crowd's going nuts, right? So you can palpate, you can feel the blood pressure, okay? So know when to palpate versus when to oscillate, all right? And there's something called orthostatic vital signs or the tilt test, okay? So uh, you wanna do this on uh, your patients if they're feeling weak or you suspect some kind of um, fluid loss or something like that. So first you lay your patient supine, right? You lay them down, right? Then you take their blood pressure and their heart rate, okay? Stand the patient up or sit them up if they can't stand, right? Um, sit them up, make sure you're holding on to them, okay? You don't want them to pass out or fall down when they stand up, okay? And after two minutes, reassess the blood pressure and heart rate, right? So the heart rate increases 10 to 20 beats per minute and the blood pressure decreases by 10 to 20, this is a positive orthostatic test. This is a positive tilt test, okay? This can indi indicate uh, blood or volume loss somewhere, okay? So uh, be careful when you're performing this test, okay? Like I said, if they lost blood or maybe they're bleeding internally or they're about to pass out, if you stand them up, they can become weak and fall back. So make sure you're holding on to your patient. Make sure you're by the sofa or something like that. Sit them up, okay? Don't have them fall out and crack their head. That's on you. That would be no bueno. Okay. Um, next, we have we're going to look at the pulse ox the pulse oximeter, right? The pulse ox. Um, this is a device that's used to measure the oxygen that's attached to the hemoglobin in your blood. Okay. This should be put on every patient. Okay. Especially your patients with respiratory issues. Okay. And early, put this on early. All right. Because you want to know if they are hypoxic or if they're, you know, they're really in need of some oxygen, okay? So um, place it on the finger for your adults and for kids. Um, it might be better to put on their toes um, or uh, sometimes uh, we have ones that are, that hook up to the monitors where it's like, kind of like a Band-Aid type deal and it can hook up to their ear or their big toe, okay? Um, so uh, yeah, those are your pulse oxes, okay? Anything less than 94%, find out what's going on. Okay, if it's less than 94%, find out why are they showing signs of hypoxia? Okay, is it on properly? Do they have fingernail polish on? Okay, check out all these things. Okay, make sure that you are oxygenating your patients who need oxygen. Okay, um, if it's less than 94%, give them O2. Okay, um, SpO2 less than 90, 90%, that's a definite indication of hypoxia. They need oxygen. Okay. Um, now, the pulse ox, what is it detecting? It's just detecting that oxygen or a gas is attached to the hemoglobin, 
Okay, it's not reading that it's actually oxygen, it's just reading that a gas, that something is attached to that hemoglobin, okay? Oxygen or other gases, okay? So let's talk about if your patient has carbon monoxide poisoning, right? House fire or, or something like that. They have carbon monoxide poisoning. You put that pulse ox on them and it says 100%. Well, yeah, because that carbon, di carbon monoxide is attached to the hemoglobin. So it says 100% because it's reading all that carbon monoxide, but they're blue and they're saying, I, you know, I can't breathe and they're showing signs of hypoxia. Don't go off of that pulse oximeter and be like, no, it says 100%, dude, you don't need nothing. No, 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 don't treat the monitor, treat that patient, okay? Especially in a suspected carbon monoxide poisoning, I don't care what it says, put them on high flow too, okay? Cool deal. Um, next, we look at the Glasgow Coma Score, okay? Or the Glasgow Coma, coma Scale. What you're gonna be doing here, this is just a score that you're gonna give uh, your patients, okay? And this lets us know how alert and oriented they are, right? So, uh, especially with your trauma patients, your, um, when, whenever you call in that hospital report and it's a bad trauma, usually the, the doctor or the nurse who you're talking to is gonna say, what's their GCS? If you don't give it to them, they wanna know, okay? So if you look here, you're gonna go down each, um, each row and give them a score. So eye opening, okay? So are they spontaneously opening their eyes? Are they looking around, are their eyes open? They get a four, okay? If you yell at them and they open their eyes, that's a three. If you give them a nice sternum rub that, and they open their eyes, that's a two. If you do all that stuff and they have nothing, that's a one, okay? So now you have a one, okay? Then you move to the verbal response, okay? If they're oriented to time, place, and person, okay? If they're making sense. Hey, how many quarters is in a dollar? And they say four. Hey, what's your name? And they say their name correct or how, you know, what month are we in? If they're answering questions appropriately, they get a five. If they're confused, they get a four. Inappropriate words, a three. Incomprehensible sounds, that's when they're like, they're, ah, right? That's a two. Um, and if they're not responding, that's a one. Best motor response, again, we're just gonna go down. They obey commands. Hey buddy, can you squeeze my hands? And they do, that's a six, right? Um, moves to localized pain, a five. Flexion, or they withdraw from pain, it's a four. Um, and then you see decorticate and decerebrate. Decorticate flexion is when they, when their arms and their hands move into their core, right? When they posture. Um, and if they uh, have extension or decerebrate posturing, that's a two. That's when it goes away from the core, right? You guys might see that in, if you guys watch football, right? And they, they get knocked out, right? And their hands kind of go up, right? That's decerebrate posturing, okay? Um, okay, cool. So you're going to upload all those. I'm sorry, you're going to, um, you're going to score all those and then you're going to let um, the, the uh, nurse know what the final score is. And you can see here, the best you can get is a 15. If we have a GCS of 15, we're doing great. Okay. Um, if they're eight or less, that's not good. And if three is the worst, okay, three is they're completely unresponsive. They're not doing good at all. Okay. Um, these are the guys you're probably going to have to be protecting their airway. Okay. Cool. So that's all the vital signs stuff that we're gonna talk about. Next, we're gonna talk about um, patient assessment. Now, what I like to do here in New Orleans, I give the assessment stuff out, the trauma and medical assessment out on the first day of class. If you guys have not been practicing your patient assessments, please do that. Because you are gonna be assessing a patient um, every day for the rest of your career, whether you're an EMT, or you move on to be a nurse or a doctor or a paramedic, whatever you go do, you're gonna assess every patient you come into contact with, whether it's a stubbed toe or the patient's not breathing or they got, they got shot up a hundred times, right? It doesn't matter. You're gonna be assessing every single patient, okay? So first thing you wanna do is your scene size up, right? Here you should be thinking about potential hazards, right? Are you gonna need additional units? Are you gonna need backup? Are you gonna need fire on scene? How many patients do you have, right? Is it a, is it a school bus rollover? right? You can't fit 80 people in the back of your ambulance. You're probably going to have to call for backup. You're going to need more ambulances, right? Um, make sure your scene is safe as well before you enter your scene. Remember, scene safety is always number one. Make sure your scene is safe and make sure you have your PPE on, your gloves, and your glasses, okay? Make sure you have that stuff on. You don't want to get anybody else's stuff on you or in you. That's never a good day. Okay. Once you reach the patient, then you can begin your primary assessment. Okay. Your primary assessment is your ABCs, right? That's when you're finding out what's going on with the patient. 
okay? Your general impression, hey, you know, you're gonna know when you're walking up to a patient, are they doing good or are they doing bad, right? If he's up and talking to me saying, oh man, you know, I twisted my ankle, no big deal. If you walk up to him and he's unresponsive and you see he's blue, he's not breathing, my general impression is pretty poor. He's not doing good, right? Um, also, you wanna determine how old they are, if there's a trauma or a medical, what's the actual chief complaint? Are they critical, are they stable? All that stuff, right? You wanna check the mental status, um, ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, and you know, figure out, hey, is this guy a priority? Do we need to load and go or stay and play, right? So let's look here on this next one. I wish I could zoom in, but that's kind of everything I just talked about here. Um, you know, if it's a trauma versus a medical, and that's how you're gonna assess them, right? So if it's a trauma patient, remember, you might be thinking about um, C-spine. You might be thinking about that cervical spine protecting um, their, uh, you know, their spine there. Um, assessing the airway, if it's open or closed, how are we gonna open it, right? Are they adequate or inadequate breathing? We're gonna breathe for them and then check their pulses, right? Um, if they're bleeding, we wanna make sure we're controlling that, right? And then same thing with your medical patients, ABCs. Always guys, with your primary assessments is your ABCs. We always say that's the stuff that's gonna kill you, okay? That's what we need to fix immediately if something's wrong. Airway, breathing, circulation. Anything's wrong with that, we need to fix that before we do anything else, before vital signs, before any of that, ABCs, okay? Um, now in the ABCs, once we fix that airway, right, we're gonna go to breathing, okay? Now, part of the breathing is we're gonna bear that chest, okay? And when we bear the chest, we're looking for any kind of you know penetrating trauma to that chest, okay? Because that's gonna kill somebody very quickly, okay? Um, a sucking chest wound needs to be fixed immediately. And how are we gonna fix it? We're gonna cover it with a gloved hand, okay? Make sure you have your gloves on. I'm not putting my hand on this dude's chest, not my bare hand anyway. Make sure you have your gloves on, okay? Uh, so gloved hand and then an occlusive dressing, okay? You wanna tape it down on three sides. Everyone should be familiar with that Vaseline gauze in class and the occlusive dressing. Show you all how to do that. You're, get with your instructors if you're not sure. You should know how to know how to do this, okay? And then paradoxical movement can happen as well. Um, paradoxical movement is when you have those rib fractures and you have that flail segment, okay? And then um, it's moving opposite of when they inhale and exhale, okay? That segment is. Okay, so you can consider positive pressure ventilation if they need it, all right? Um, so those are your ABCs, right? If you're bleeding, right, or you don't have a pulse, right, we're gonna do compressions, or if they're bleeding out, we're gonna stop that bleeding with a tourniquet, and you guys, well, I don't know, we usually do that in the trauma sections at, towards the end of class, but anyway, ABCs first, then we can move into our secondary assessment, okay? Our secondary assessment is where we're going to fix other stuff, right? Okay, so if it's a, if it's a trauma, this is where we're gonna do our splinting, okay? This is where we're gonna do our little boo-boos, where we fix our boo-boos, right? Or if it's a medical, this is where we do our sample OPQRST, Okay, everyone should know that mnemonic, sample OPQRST. Again, I give these out in the very beginning of class because this is very, very important stuff, okay? Kind of like A and P, anatomy and physiology is the foundation of all, you know, this book work and all this stuff. You gotta know the body and how it works. The patient assessment is the foundation for all your treatments, right? So you have gotta learn how to assess a patient um, so you can figure out what's going on with them and then you, you treat them. Okay, so please guys, make sure you're doing a good assessment. Sample OPQRST, everyone should know those. You do a good sample OPQRST, you're gonna find out what's going on with that patient. You're gonna get some kind of information out of him to where you're gonna know what's actually bothering them and how you're gonna treat them and what they need, okay? If you don't do a good assessment, you're not gonna find out stuff, especially with your trauma patients, guys, okay? You can't treat what you can't see. Okay, that's what we tell you, get them trauma naked, right? Cut their clothes off if it's a bad trauma. Now, if you go up to somebody and they have a, a stubbed toe, please don't cut their clothes off, okay? That's gonna be, you know, a scene, possibly a lawsuit and news coverage, don't do that, okay? But if they get ejected from a vehicle or they get shot multiple times, right? You're gonna have to cut those that patient's clothes off because you're gonna wanna make sure you're seeing everything, okay? Keep them modest, right? After you check them and make sure nothing's going on, cover them back up, okay? When you're bringing them into the ER, okay? But um, think about it. You can't treat what you can't see, okay? So if you're not doing a good assessment and you miss an exit wound out the back or you miss, a, you know, a, a puncture wound, 
um, on the side in the chest, okay, you're going to kill your patient faster, okay? You're not helping them. So please, guys, make sure you're doing a good assessment on your patients, okay? ABCs and then a good head-to-toe sample OPQRST. All right, and um, next is medications, okay? So what do we do to administer medications? So some of our medications, you have to obtain an order, and you guys should know the differences here, um, know when to obtain an order, um, which, which, which medications, okay? Um, make sure you're selecting the proper medication. Some of our medications look similar, okay? Do not give someone the wrong medication, okay? You can kill somebody. Don't give them the wrong medication. I tell everybody, make sure you check in those five rights because once you give a drug, you cannot ungive it. So please, guys, make sure you know, you're checking your medications, making sure they don't have allergies, okay? It's very important to ask about allergies because what if you go to give them aspirin and you don't ask if they're allergic to aspirin and they are, and they chew that aspirin, <sighs> you might've just killed them, okay? So make sure you're asking about allergies, okay? Check those five rights, the right medication, the right date, the right dose, the right route, and the right patient, okay? And then you wanna document, you wanna make sure you have this on file that you actually gave um, your patients this medication, okay? So let's talk about the different medications we give here at the EMT level, all right? Oxygen, yes, that is a medication, okay? Um, know all these terms, indications, contraindications, right? So an indication is why you would give something. A contraindication is why you wouldn't give it, right? So no big ones with this, okay, with uh, oxygen. Just if they're short of breath, if they're hypoxic, you want to give oxygen, okay? Um, the form is a gas, right? It's oxygen. Um, dosage, it varies. You can give them, you know, you decide that, okay? Um, no real side effects. The action is it, uh, you know, it attaches to blood and it actionates the patient, all right? So oxygen, that's a pretty common one. We give that to a lot of our patients. Okay, let's talk about glucose 15, all right? Oral glucose or insta-glucose, okay? This is basically just candy, guys. This is like sugar, okay? It's like a gel form of sugar, okay? Your indications are an altered mental status. So why would you give it to an altered mental status patient who has a history of diabetes and a blood glucose level less than 60, okay? So check that blood sugar. You guys should be checking a blood sugar on every single patient, especially your altered mental status patients. Remember, brain needs two things, oxygen and sugar. Without them, you're gonna start acting funny. You're gonna get altered, okay? So if they have a blood sugar level of 42, okay, and they're altered, they might need this, okay? Contraindication is unresponsive or unconscious patient or an inability to swallow or follow directions, okay? They're gonna have to get this orally, okay? That's the dose, I'm sorry, that's the, uh, that's the route. They're gonna get this orally. Um, it's a gel, okay? Uh, they're gonna have to like swallow this stuff. So you don't wanna give this to an unresponsive patient because then they're gonna aspirate it. That's not good, okay? Um, the medication form is a gel. Uh, the dosage is typically 15 grams, right? Or the one tube, the whole tube, okay? And the way it works is it increases blood and brain sugar levels, okay? It's going to increase the sugar levels in the blood and those brain cells, okay? Uh, side effects, no real side effects, maybe a delayed response, okay? It does take a few minutes to work, okay? Um, but it's basically just candy, okay? But the big thing here is they have to be able to take it, okay? You can't give it to someone who's unresponsive. All right, let's talk about this one that you're never going to give, activated charcoal. Okay, uh, medication names might be Superchar, Instachar, Actidose, Liquichar, all these things, they're all the same thing, activated charcoal, okay? Uh, your indications, uh, it's very rarely used, like I just said, you're never gonna use it, most likely. Um, it may be ordered if it can be administered shortly after the ingestion of opioids, anticholinergics, or medications with a sustained release. Okay, your contraindications and altered mental status, if they swallowed acids or alkalis, an inability to swallow, cyanide overdose, okay? So you see all those indications and contraindications, it's gotta be like a very specific medication. Wow, oh, somebody just drove by here really fast. Um, so yeah, it's gotta be a very specific medication. It has to be within a certain amount of time since they ingested it, okay? Um, and it can't be other types of medications, so. Very, very rarely are you going to even be able to use this. And then if you would be able to, you'd have to get a, 
uh, um, order and all that stuff. And we don't even carry these on the trucks, but you guys have to know it. Okay. So uh, the medication form, it's like a suspension, right? It's like, it's charcoal mixed in water. It's like a powder charcoal mixed in water. Okay. Um, it's like the stuff you barbecue with just ground up and mixed in like a water form. All right. Um, the dosage is one gram per kilogram. Okay. So it's weight based. All right. Um, the action is it binds with the poisons in the stomach and prevents absorption in the intestines. Okay. So like I said, it has to be within that specific amount of time. If you took, you know, if you overdose too long ago, this isn't going to work because it's already out of your stomach and it's being absorbed in your intestines. Okay. Um, and the side effects, blackening of the stool, they're going to be pooping charcoal bricks. Okay. Um, and possible vomiting. They're not going to be able to swallow this stuff. It's disgusting. Okay. It's very nasty and they can very rarely actually swallow the whole thing and take it down. So cool. Let's talk about aspirin. Okay. Um, aspirin, uh, the indications, uh, chest pain, right? That is suggestive of a heart attack. Um, and you need uh, medical direction for this, right? So the contraindications, patient with a known allergy to the drug. Okay. Um, if they have an, uh, an allergy to aspirin, don't give them aspirin. The uh, form is a tablet. Okay. They're going to chew it up. Okay. They're going to chew it up. Uh, your dosage is 81 to 320 four milligrams, okay, chewed. Now, um, you'll see on some tests where it says 324 milligrams or 325 milligrams, same thing, okay? Because the way we carry it here in EMS, we have uh, 81 milligram tablets. So you would get four of those that reach 324 milligrams. Or sometimes you'll see one 325 milligram tablet, same thing, okay? Um, the action, it decreases the ability of the platelets to clump together, okay? Um, it, yeah, so when someone's having a heart attack or they have that blockage, okay, this is making sure that blockage does not get any bigger, okay? And the side effects, possible stomach irritation. All right, so know those. You guys are going to have to know all these drugs in and out. The indications, contraindications, the form, the dosage, the action, the side effects, everything. So what I suggest is you make drug cards, we call them. So like um, you can write this stuff out on index cards and study it. You should know these backward and front, okay? Nitroglycerin, nitroglycerin. This is also something we give for chest pain, okay? Again, it's gotta be um, medical direction ordered, okay? Um, some contraindications. These are very important contraindications, so listen up. A systolic blood pressure of less than 90, okay? Um, if they have a blood pressure that's 90 or below, do not give this to them, okay? Also, erectile dysfunction medications on board. So if they've taken this with, if they've taken Cialis or Viagra, okay, or something like that within the last 12 to 36 hours, do not give them this, okay? Also, if they have a head injury, if it's a kid, um, if they had the max dose of three, don't give it to them, okay? The medication form is going to either be a tablet or a sublingual spray. Either way, it's going to go underneath their tongue. They don't chew it, they don't swallow it, it goes under their tongue. Okay, your dosage is 0.4 milligrams sublingual, okay, um, or 400 micrograms, same thing, um, sublingual under the tongue, okay, this can be repeated every three to five minutes up to three times, okay, as long as that blood pressure is still good, okay, it vasodilates, okay, so if they have that blockage, what this is doing is making the tunnel bigger, so the blood can go around that blockage and feed that heart, okay. Um, <clears throat> side effects, you're going to have a headache. They're going to complain about a halo headache, like a ring around their head, squeezing their head. Um, a decrease in blood pressure, you will see that because of the vasodilation, right? Cool. Um, albuterol. Okay, so albuterol can come in um, nebulizers or inhalers. Okay, either way. Um, the indication is, you know, uh, shortness of breath. Uh, due to uh, bronchoconstriction, okay, uh, like asthma patients or COPD patients. Um, a contraindication, if they're altered, they, you know, they can't take it, they're unresponsive, stuff like that, they got to breathe this in, right? Um, a medication form, it's aerolized in a meter dose inhaler, or it's, uh, um, it's a liquid and you're going to nebulize it, and everybody should be familiar with the nebulizers in class, okay? Get with your instructor, 
find out how to use those if you don't know how to use them. Um, your dosage, uh, the meter dose inhaler is a meter dose. It's like a pre-measured dose for that patient, okay? Um, and then the nebulizer is usually 2.5 milligrams in the albuterol tablet, okay? Uh, so just get that order and find out what, uh, how much they want you to get because pediatrics can be different. Um, the action is it's a bronchodilator, that beta-2 agonist is going to open up the bronchial. It's going to open up those lungs so the patient can uh, breathe better, okay? It's going to decrease airway resistance so more oxygen can get further down into those alveoli for gas exchange. Um, tachycardia uh, is a side effect. Um, tremors, they can get a little shaky afterwards. If, you know, this is pretty popular with kids. Some kids have pediatric asthma. I know my, my oldest one did. Um, when he was a little bitty kid, he had asthma when he was like three or four. Man, do not give this stuff at night. They are going to be bouncing off the walls and not going to sleep anytime soon. Um, so yeah, give that to them and you will see some tachycardia and some nervousness and some jitters. That's normal. Okay. Um, epinephrine, EpiPen, auto injectors. Okay. Um, indications, signs and symptoms of moderate to severe allergic reaction with respiratory distress and signs of shock anaphylaxis, okay? No real contraindications, just don't give it to them if they don't need it. When do they need it? So an allergic reaction. If I am allergic to bees and I get stung and I have a whelp on my arm and maybe some hives, okay, cool. I might just need something else, some Benadryl or something like that. But if my airway starts to get involved and my lungs start to close up and I start wheezing, okay, that's when I need that epinephrine, okay? That's when it's an anaphylactic reaction rather than just a regular allergic, hey, I'm itchy. Okay, um, medication form, it's a liquid that's in an auto injector. All right, your dosage is 0.3 milligrams um, intramuscular or 0.15 milligrams intramuscular for your pediatrics. Okay, so 0.3 milligrams intramuscular for your adults and 0.15 milligrams intramuscular for your pediatrics. And you'll see it says EpiPen or EpiPen Junior. Um, the action, it vasoconstricts and bronchodilates. Okay, it vasoconstricts and bronchodilates. Um, it's reversing everything that's going on in an anaphylactic reaction. Side effects, of course, you, this is basically adrenaline, guys. So increased heart rate, um, they might complain of chest pain, headache, nausea, vomiting, all that stuff, okay? Because you just shot them with adrenaline, so. Um, and our last one that we're going to talk about, I believe it's the last one, yeah, Narcan, okay, or Naloxone. Um, indications for this, unresponsiveness with suspected opioid overdose or respiratory dis uh, depression associated with an opioid overdose, okay? So if Christian comes to class and he's teaching you guys, okay, and he's up and talking and he's slurring a little bit and you're like, Christian, Christian's going off that, he's on that sauce. That dude's big loaded on dirty Sprite, son. So if I'm talking and I'm walking and stuff like that, I might just be high. I don't need that, right? So Narcan is for when someone is unresponsive. They've overdose to the point where they are out of it. They're unresponsive, they're not breathing, okay? We need to give them Narcan, okay? Um, contraindications, um, infants that are born to addicted moms due to severe withdrawal in the infant, so you gotta be careful with that. Um, but there's no real bad side effects, right? So some side, of, well, we'll get into side effects in a minute, but it really can't hurt because it only works in opiates, okay? So um, the medication form, it's a liquid, and it's gonna get vaporized so it can um, absorb in the uh, mucosa, in the nasal mucosa. So you're gonna give it intranasally. Okay, you're gonna connect that little thing that you see there, that little white triangle piece. It's a, called a MAD device, a mucosal atomization device. You're gonna screw that on the top and it, um, it uh, turns it basically into a mist so it can absorb in the nasal mucosa, okay? It also comes in an intramuscular injection form too. Um, your dose is two milligrams um, intranasally um, or one milligram for the infants, okay, for little ones. Uh, the action is it binds to the opiate receptors and it blocks the effects of that narcotic, okay? Um, it basically gives them an instant withdrawal. So the side effects, uh, they might have some nausea vomiting because you just put them in an instant withdrawal, okay? Um, agitation and combativeness too because you just ruin their high, okay? So you don't know what these people had to do to get that. And now, even though you just saved their life, they're really mad at you because uh, you took away their high and they may be really, really angry and wanna fight you. So just be prepared for that. So be prepared to suction and be prepared for an angry and combative patient. Uh, and that's all the slides we have guys for module 
four. Um, so yeah, know the vital signs, know how to take them, um, know the different uh, presentations for the skin, um, for the eyes, for the pupils, right? Um, know how to calculate a GCS score because uh, you're probably going to see that on the exam. Uh, patient assessment, guys, know when to do what. ABCs is your primary assessment. That's your life threats. All the other stuff can be done in the secondary assessment, okay? <clears throat> so know the difference between primary and secondary assessment. That is important, okay? Um, and all your drugs, guys, know these in and out, okay? Drugs, pharmacology is very important because once you give something, you cannot take it back, okay? And you should know this. You should know why you're giving something. You should know how it's working, that's gonna help you understand why you're giving it because you know what the drug is doing, okay? So cool. So uh, get with your local instructors if you have any questions about that stuff. I hope you guys are doing well in class. And yeah, holler at me if you need something, guys. Have an awesome day.